This is the second of two short videos using stereo nets to understand fold geometry. So in the first video, we just considered some simple limb geometries where the intersection of the two limbs represented the hinge line of the fold. On the stereogram, we could plot each of these limbs as great circles, the intersection of the great circles to find a hinge line, and the plane whose pole was the hinge line is the profile plane, and within that we could estimate the interlimb angle. It's a very simple technique, and it works pretty well when folds are very angular, such as our folded piece of cardboard here, so that each limb has its own unique orientation. We can also do this with poles, and as we'll see, poles to planes give us greater flexibility in the types of folds we can analyse. So how does this work? Well, let's visualise a more general type of fold, where the limbs gradually arch over one to the other to find a broader hinge area. There's still a distinct place along this layer where the curvature is maximum, so there's still a distinct hinge line. So here we have our poles to the yellow layer poking out from that layer at 90 degrees, fanning around the fold structure. So here's the hinge line of the fold plunging down to the bottom right hand corner. What's the relationship between these poles to the layer and the fold geometry? Well, let's put in the fold profile plane. There we go, perpendicular to the hinge line. And the poles to the layer all lie within the profile plane. So therefore we can use the poles to the folded layer, a folded bed, to find the profile plane and then using the profile plane orientation, find the fold hinge line orientation. So what we need to do is put our poles to bedding and find the best fit great circle, a girdle through all those poles, and then use that best fit girdle to find the hinge line. Let's see how this works using a data set. So here's our stereographic projection, and what we've got here are an array of seven bedding readings measured across a fold. And we're going to plot the poles to these beddings in turn. So in this, I'm going to assume you know how to plot poles to bedding. So we can just crack on with this new part of the analysis. So let's plot these in turn. So here's the first bedding orientation, 01060 east is the orientation of the bedding. The pole therefore sits over there in the western quadrant. So now let's just plot the others on. Here's 00866 east. Here's 01660 east. So all three of these, the dip beds dip east, so the poles plunge west. Here's 22250 west as the orientation of the bed, and its pole now is down there in the eastern quadrant. The next one, 22850 west, again, dipping west, so it's, so the pole sits over there on the eastern side. And this one here, 220.58 west, again, the pole plunges off to the eastern side. And finally, 142.20 north, so the pole plunges down to the southern side. So there are the poles to the seven beds. So now we need to find the great circle upon which these might lie. In other words, a best fit great circle. So we just spin the tracing paper around to find the best fit great circle. And there we go. Something like that. There's a bit of uncertainty, but the red trace of the great circle there is more or less a best fit to the seven poles to bedding that we've got. This is the full profile plane. And the pole to this profile plane is the hinge line. And there it sits over on the right hand side of the diagram, the northern side of the stereo net. So we can read off the plunge. And it's something like 22 degrees in from the side of the stereo net. So the fold hinge plunges about 22 on a bearing. Well, let's spin it around and have a look. Something like that. So towards about 025 degrees. So our fold hinge has an orientation of 22 degrees plunging off towards 025. 
We can also read off the orientation of the great circle, which is there, which is 116 as a strike, 78 degrees dip towards the south. Now that might be as far as we want to take this analysis, but we could also identify the fold limbs from this collection of data. And if the limbs are long and the hinge area relatively small, then there'll be two clusters of bedding, one from each limb. If we look at our data set, that's what we see here. There are two clusters of poles, which presumably represent two distinct limbs. What we can do now is estimate a mean orientation for each of these two clusters. And this mean orientation will be a mean pole for the limb. And then we can plot these up as great circles. So let's do this. So here we have the western plunging set of poles over on the left hand side of the diagram. And the great circle shown by the dashed line is the great circle who has as its pole the mean of that left hand cluster. Let's just do that again with the right hand, in other words, the cluster of poles over on the eastern side of the stereo net. And we can see we have a great circle now arching around on the western side. These two great circles intersect at the hinge line, which we've already found, as of course they should do. And that is our fold geometry, our two limbs intersecting at the hinge line. We could go on now, of course, and measure the interlimb angle if we know something about the orientation of the fold. So, if we assume that the fold is an upright fold, in other words, the axial surface is pretty steep, then the interlimb angle is this angle in here, about 70 degrees between the two limbs, measured in the profile plane. So there's our analysis. Poles, then, are a great way of dealing with an array of data from a fold structure. But we can do something more than that. The approach we've used so far has assumed that there's a single orientation of a hinge line. In other words, that the fold is cylindrical. Rather like in the sketch and in the photograph, which comes from the Swiss Alps. For a cylindrical fold, there's a single hinge line. Therefore, there's a single orientation of a profile plane. So if we plot this in a stereo net, we have a single profile plane running like this and the hinge, as we can see, like this. And in this particular example, the profile plane is vertical, so the hinge line is horizontal, plotting on either side of the stereo net. But not all folds are cylindrical. What about this one here? Rather like looking down on this banana, so that the hinge line makes a saddle shape. In this particular situation, there are different profile planes depending where we are along the hinge line. We're assuming that the hinge line stays on the same trend, so the plunge direction is the same, but the plunge amount varies and indeed it switches from quadrant to quadrant. So on a stereo net, the hinge lines smear out, as do the profile planes. If the hinge line keeps a constant direction of plunge, the profile planes have a common strike but their dips vary, so they create a bow area of places where the, where the profile plane may be. And the hinge lines spread out, as you can see, by the yellow dots. So that's one type of curvilinear fold hinge. It's not the only way fold hinges can be curvilinear. They can be curvilinear like this. So this time, the looking down on our fold, the hinge line is changing trend. And in this simple example, we're assuming that the plunge remains constant. Let's pop on our profile planes for this structure. Here we go, there'll be something like this, fanning around, and on a stereo net, if the hinge line keeps a zero plunge amount, but, the, but changes trend, the profile planes will remain vertical, but will change their strike, creating a fan of orientations, as you can see on the stereo plot. So we can deduce the curvilinearity of fold structures by plotting poles to bedding around the folds, and then assessing the array of different hinge line orientations and their profile planes. These two deviations away from the cylindrical patterns are end members. Intermediates are much more likely, where not only does the hinge line change plunge, but also plunge direction.
How do we deal with these situations if we suspect that's what's going on? Well, the way to do this is to build up profiles, transects across the fold, perpendicular to more or less the direction we think the hinge line might be going, and to plot the stereonet bit by bit, building packages of these transects one after the other. And each transect should yield its own hinge line, its own profile plane. And so you can systematically work out how a fold may be varying in geometry as you move along it. So a quick look at how we can use poles and the girdle of poles which make the profile planes to understand hinge lines and their variations in folds. These are really powerful techniques and they form the basis for many regional analyses of fold belts.